So here's my little bit about St. Patrick. Um, this is a terrible thing that happens to me every once in a while, but I need a name and I can't recall it. But anyway, the unnamed person whose name I cannot recall has written a series of books that he is entitled, a series entitled The Hinges of History. The first book in that is The Gift of the Jews, how a small band of desert nomads changed the world. The second book is How the Irish Saved Civilization. Now you might not think that the Irish actually did save civilization, but they did because this book deals with what happens after the fall of the Roman Empire and all these various barbarian groups, non-Christian groups, come in and settle in territory that had been part of the Roman Empire, and the monks that were on the island of Ireland who were spared that invasion went back to continental Europe and re-Christianized it. So, Thomas Chastain, that's it. Yeah. Now, he wrote, uh, the gifts of the Jews, how the Irish saved civilizations, saving the wine dark sea, why the Greeks matter, Desire of the Everlasting Hills, which is about Jesus, and Mysteries of the Middle Ages. It's all the and the But so, so it is really good to celebrate St. Patrick because, because Patrick goes back and Christianizes Ireland. Ireland goes back to continental Europe and Christianizes it again after the church had been pretty much eliminated by the barbarian hordes that had come in after the fall of the Roman Empire. That's why we're here today. We owe, we owe the Irish a lot. Now, grace and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jeremiah is one of my favorite guys in the Bible. He just is. He, he's unique. He does things that other people do. He, he says that one, you know, he, he's called to be a prophet at a fairly young age, somewhere in the early 600s, you know, 605, 600. And he disappears from history in year 587 when he's kidnapped by people who revolted against Babylon and carry him off to Egypt where presumably he dies. We just don't know. We never hear of him again. But while he's there, he serves God as a prophet to the people of Israel. And he does it. He's got a couple of really good things that he does. One, one is... He feels the pain of what he has to say to the people of Israel about the way they're living deeply and personally, so much so that at one point in the book, he says, I wish that they had cursed the man who ran out to the field to tell my father that he had a son born and that I had died as an infant rather than bring these words to the people of Israel. And his words were so objectionable that at one point they took him and threw him in it in a dry well to leave him. Eventually one of his buddies put a ladder down and he got him out. And as they were under siege by the Babylonians, he did this very strange thing. He met with the real estate broker and bought a, big, bought a field at the village of Anathoth, which was about 10, 12 miles outside of Jerusalem. He did this as a symbolic act to say, in spite of the devastation that's coming from the Babylonians, there will be a resurrected Judea. The people of Israel will remain alive and will remain God's people and will continue into the future. Now that's an amazing thing to do. He didn't live to see that, but he probably wouldn't live, but he got carried off and didn't hear much after it all that. And then there is this passage today. Many years ago now, I had a dear gentleman who was a member of the congregation. I was so a nice guy, you couldn't have asked for a better guy. He told me one day, he says, you know, all I care about is the New Testament. I don't care about anything that's in the Old Testament. We don't need it. I don't even know why we have it. And I looked at him kind of stunned disbelief of you know, I'm kind of an Old Testament geek. And uh, I said, do you really understand what you're saying? He said, no, what? I said, 
Yes. You got one of the Bibles at home that's got all the words of Jesus in red? He says, yes, yeah. it's about 95% of them are coming out of the Old Testament. And he had never really thought about that before. I said, if we didn't have the Old Testament, we wouldn't have all this stuff that Jesus said. In John, we get a story of Jesus' self-preparation for his death and what's going to happen. And it's interesting, it starts out to do the festival, and there's some Greeks there. Now I got to tell you folks, in case you're wondering about this, there were Greeks everywhere. That's you know, uh, that's the uh, gift that Alexander the Great left everybody. Is they were very went and conquered, they moved a whole bunch of Greeks in there, and they they were still there. And we, and they go to Philip. Now you say, why did they choose Philip? You know, did they did they draw straws or something like that? No, Philip's a Greek name. Alexander the Great's father was named Philip. Andrew, not Scottish, but Greek. They go to the two guys with Greek names, figuring that since they're Greeks, they'll have a better chance getting to meet Jesus through them than some of the other guys that got those difficult to understand and pronounce Hebrew names. And then Jesus has this speech about his upcoming death. And what it's going to be. And in it he says, what should I do? Should I try and turn away from this? And escape this? He says, no, this is why I came. This is my purpose. I came here to fulfill God's word. word that you get in Jeremiah. In those three short verses in Jeremiah today, God refers to the whole history of Israel for that time. He said, I established a covenant with them, with me as the groom, and they were the bride, and I led them out of slavery, and I gave them a good land, and I have been with them all the time, and they keep breaking my covenant. And they've broken it so bad this time, they're going into captivity. But there's another time coming, and I will write my law in their hearts, and they shall no longer have to teach one another what the Lord wants, and I will forgive their sin and remember their iniquity no more. Think about that. I will forgive their sin and remember their iniquity. Now, if you're wondering what iniquity means, that's all the little bad things that we do all the time, sometimes a little, little bit bigger than little bad things. The kind of things that, uh, well, you know, when we were teenagers, we didn't want mom to know we had done. And then when we got to be older, the kind of things that we did, we didn't want our children to know we had done. That's what and the truth is, we all got it. If any of us can say, oh no, not me. Because we're all guilty, guilty, guilty. And yet the promise of God way back in somewhere around 597 to 587 BC when this text is recorded, Jeremiah says, God will forgive your sins and remember your iniquity no more. It's just like getting to go up on the blackboard and erase the stuff that you did in math class that was wrong. And you don't get this, you don't get it counted off against you. And Jesus, in this speech that he gives after these Greeks have come to see him, is telling us that stuff Jeremiah said, that comes to fruition comes to full fruit in me. In me. Because I am going to my death for you. This is how God is going to work this forgiveness of sin, this forgetfulness of iniquity in 
me, there will be salvation. You know, we're two weeks from in for that. Next Sunday, we will begin the service with liturgy with palms, and then we will move into <coughs> liturgy of passion. And I think uh, Johnny's got the uh, gospel text down to four pages. Um, y'all just gonna have y'all can sit if you have to. But it's a long gospel. It's, it's the whole what we call passion narrative. It's something we all need to hear at least once a year. We'll hear part of it again on Monday, Thursday, and part of it again on Good Friday. And then there's Easter morning. <coughs> Get back to all the hallelujahs that we've been without all through the net. You get back to him the praise that we've been without all through the net. And you get to rejoice in what God has done for us. In what God has done for us. We don't do it for ourselves. God does it for us. And then he gives us an invitation live in Christ and live in the Father and the Spirit at the same time. And he never quits inviting. We don't ever get so bad that God says, well, yeah, you use up all your chances. It never happens. God's desire is to live with us in a relationship of mutual love in which we are brought into the fellowship of the people of God. And we live there through this world and, do, and into whatever comes next. I'm real shaky on what that is. Except that I trust God is going to do it. It's going to be good. I do believe this, though, that when we get there, if we get to heaven and all like that, we're going to be 25 styling and profiling again. This old broken up body I've got now is not going to be the one I have to live through eternity with. That's my hope anyway. God gives us the offer. Again, again, and again. We remember verse John 3, not 16, but 17 from last Sunday. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but, so, but that through him the whole world might be saved. Since we're a part of the whole world, God intends us to be saved. That's the truth. And God works with us continually that we get to live that saved life now and at whenever the last day is. God chooses us. <laughs>